Hey, this is CJ coming to you live from Black ENT. <laughs> and uh, we are here in a podcast for my opinion. So I am Constance Connor from Nino you know, as CJ or CC. Um, I am a dean of engagement currently and a public speaker. Um, my background is in sociology, criminal justice, psychology. I have a master's in public administration, and I'm currently getting a doctorate in sociology and a master's in sociology. And I'm here with my partner in crime, Marquise. Uh, I just got a degree, undergrad in sports management. Um, you can call me Marquise, Mark, whatever. I'm Champagne just cool. Poppy. Okay, we got to tell everybody <laughs> that. But uh, yeah, I hope you all enjoy. All right, so uh, today we're just talking about being a black uh, professional in a millennial age. So what's your thoughts right now, Marquise, when we think about like being a young black professional I, right now, um, so I'm 28 years old. Marquise is also 28 years old. So we kind of been in the job field just over like maybe five years now, really. Yeah. Um, since we got out of school and just we have been just seeing a couple common themes with us being millennials and being black and young in a professional setting. Uh, what do you think is your hardest challenge right now? So because of where I work at, so I work at a, uh, I work in a restaurant that's at a golf course. So it's already, I feel like, sometimes at a disadvantage just because the uh, demographic of the people are already opposite of who we are. Mm -hmm. So I feel like when I go in, I sometimes have to temper who I am being growing up black and knowing, you know, doing the things that we do because they don't always get that. And then the stuff like just some of my natural reactions that I do, they think that it's funny. And I'm like, no, that's just who I am. I don't quite understand what's the, uh, the joke about it or anything. I'm just completely being me. And doing my own thing. And uh, I just feel like it's it can be tough, but it also can be a a, a good thing to do. It's just kind of hard sometimes growing up young and yeah. trying to uh, figure out and navigate that uh, platform. Yeah. I, um, for me, my experience um, overall was being young, black professional. Uh, it's been a little challenging just because, like, being a black female, especially in the different settings, it's just like, hey, well, uh, I always gotta watch what you say, like my demeanor yeah. or my tone. Yeah. When I'm um doing certain things, um, I know you just was talking with your hands. I talk with my hands a lot as well. Yeah. And that could be looked to be as aggressive <clears throat> at times. Like speak with your hands and just your body language overall. The hardest thing I have had to face is the cold switching aspect of you know trying to keep that perfect balance of like, hey, I'm still young. I want to kick it. But then just, like, how I carry myself when I'm in that setting. So, like, just not having a real safe space yeah. to code switch. Yeah. 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 So I, I feel like some of the stuff that's acceptable for our, uh, let's just, white counterparts at work, it's not always acceptable for us to do. So, like, because I work at a restaurant and it's it's always openly okay for everybody to have a drink. You know, you want to drink, relax, and do that. And for some people, they – can go way overboard and just drink, 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 and then they get completely drunk, and it's okay. But if I was to do that, I feel like there would be kind of weird eyes. So I just kind of watch the balance of everything that I do and watch how it uh, affects me and then watch how it affects other people and stuff like that. Yeah. <clears throat> I feel like the same because I work in a school. Yeah. So, like, being in the school district, it's like I'm always constantly, like, thinking, like, when I go out, like, can I have as much fun as I want to? You know, like, what do I wear? Um, is what I'm wearing okay? Because if somebody see me out, like I see one of my student parents out, I don't want them to be like, man, I seen her out on Saturday, and she got on a crop top and booty shorts, and then they see me on Monday in a suit, and it's like, oh, do I really want this person around my kid? But it's like, I'm not around your kid right now. You know, I would never, yeah. uh, you know, I have a different mask when I'm around your child. You know, I'm doing what's best for them. But when I'm out, you know, being me, Versus, like, having to have on that professional hat all the time. So, let, let me ask you, because I know a couple of people that are uh, teachers. Mm -hmm. And they are very conscious of what they post on social media. Yeah. So, are you one of those that you kind of watch and you... Because I know social media is hot. It's humongous all over the place right now. So, everybody wants to post everything that they're doing. Do you, like, kind of watch oh, what yeah. it is you put up? Definitely, I watch what I'm doing, like... um like, I don't post too much stuff on Facebook because I feel like that's where, like, um, my my students' parents really are, like, on Facebook and stuff like mm -hmm. that. And then on Instagram, my page is private. <clears throat> and I, I know a lot of people get annoyed with that because I had to monitor, you know, like, who is trying to watch what I'm doing and just, like, not letting people have full access to me like that. 
And I also have a close friends, of course, you know, in my story that, you know, that if I am doing something I feel like I want to post and it may not be, um, I'm not going to say risky, but it just may be like appropriate for a dean or, you know, my position that isn't my close friends. So only like very selective people can see a part of my life. Okay. Mm. Yeah. I, 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 for a little bit after, uh, well, not after, but while I was still in college, I did some tutoring at schools Mm -hmm. and I kind of know how it affected, so I kind of wanted to watch, and I was in, uh, did it in the Heights area, so I could, like, just go out, and I would see some students. Like, yeah. I'd just go to a grocery store, go to a sneaker store over there, and i see somebody. So I was always, even at a younger age, I started to learn how to just uh, temper and watch what it is, everything that I do or whatever. Yeah. So do you feel like, um, and just kind of moving past that subject and on that subject, do you feel like since you've gotten a degree – Mm-hmm. That you think that has brought more value to you, or do you think that it's kind of brought a ch- challenge or a hindrance? Uh, I, I would say it brought more value, just because of the fact that not everybody gets a degree, and that's not to knock or shame anybody. Because some people just I don't want a degree, but for me personally, I think that it has because I've know my family and they value education. Mm-hmm. And when I was younger, I didn't always. I was more so focused on everything else, but it wasn't until about my senior year in college where I really started to focus on senior year in high school, not college, senior year in high school where I really started to focus on the value of of knowledge and learning more and uh, just taking it serious and realizing that you can learn and you can educate yourself outside of the classroom. Mm -hmm. So you can read books, you can look stuff up on YouTube, you can read articles. So just being able to do that. But, yes, I think it brought me value. Okay. I think I brought me values, but I think it also brought me some hindrance as well. Okay. Um, cause like I'm like you, like for one, like I was, I was worried about basketball. Like that was my whole thing. Like right. I wanted to hoop. That was it. I was like, I'm going to school to hoop. I'm not going to school to go to school. I'm going to school to go play basketball. But you know, as time went on, just the realization of like me being in college, like understanding like the. Like, you not going to the league. <laughs> and, like, yeah. having yeah. a fallback plan, I think I value. But I think it was a hindrance as well because, I don't know me, maybe it's a complex within me. I feel like if somebody's trying to challenge me or trying to, like, up one me, it's like, okay, well, who are you to me to mm-hmm. be telling me this? And I'm saying that if you don't have a degree, that that's not it because, like, I'm a big person, like, Everybody don't need a degree. School is not for everybody. Yeah. You take your own thing. But there are times, like, when I'm in that setting, when I'm with my opposite counterparts, that I feel like I need to make sure that you know every single accolade I have. Okay. So See, I feel like it's, like, a hindrance to me because I feel like, all right, when I'm with my, you know, when I'm with people of my um, color, I don't feel like I need to say, like, I need a de- I got a degree. Yeah. But when I'm with my opposite counterparts, like, my white counterparts, I do feel like I need to let them know, like, hey, no, I... And well educated past yeah, yeah. I, the I, basics. I, I get that. I don't really look at it as a hindrance though, because mm-hmm. I pretty much the place that I work at, I've been there all through college, and I'm still in there and just kind of working my way up. But they know when I got the degree, and it's for me, it's not like a lot of things change. Mm-hmm. Maybe it was just my own uh, mental aspect of it. I'm like, okay, so now I have this degree. So maybe in a way, it made me feel like, okay, I have a degree. These people have degrees of some sort or they have this. So now I feel like not belong, but I'm rightfully in this place. Yeah. Like I'm not just here by happenstance. Like I'm actually here on purpose. Right. So that's what I, how I kind of look at the degree. Okay. So <clears throat> do you find that you use your degree? Because that's a big question that we talk I think, you know, us being friends, because like me have been friends since high school. Yeah. So we kind of had a little powwow about, you know, people being able to use the degree yeah. in their actual field. I mean, right now, well, no, because my degree is in sports management and I work in a restaurant and I'm doing that. But I think further down the line, at some point, I'm pretty sure that because all the outside uh, outside things that I have getting ready to happen and going on, I'm pretty sure that I will be using it. But just right out of college, no, I didn't use it. But okay. that does not mean that I don't think because I'm not using it right now that it wasn't worth it. Okay. Yeah, I was agree. Um, I was lucky enough that I did go into my uh, degree uh-huh. right away. I built my career off of my degree. You know, just having that uh, pretty much that uh, social work, that social science. I was able to you know work at the Rape Crisis Center, and then I got into the school 
where I kind of maneuver because I, you know, I never planned on working with kids. I was going to be a lawyer. <laughs> right. I don't know how I got here, but um, with that being said, I do feel like I've used my degree and a lot of things. But do you feel like right now for Black culture that degrees or entrepreneurship is more important? Like, is education more important right now, or is entrepreneurship teaching um, our generation the aspect of entrepreneurship? I, I, I think they're both important, but I don't think that they're apart from each other. Okay. I think that they're actually together because if you are an entrepreneur, you are educating yourself in that certain field. So, like, my mom, she has been starting this for, like, the last few years. She's now a uh, trainer. Yeah. So, constantly, she is educating herself, constantly taking to new tests, constantly um, just upgrading her knowledge of what, when it first started, compared to be making sure that it can transform. So I think that if you can do both and if you are set on being an entrepreneur and you choose a field, you choose something, obviously you spend time doing that. So I believe that that's also training yourself and I believe it's education to just experience. Because in my opinion, uh, experience is the best uh, teacher. Yeah, absolutely. Like, yeah. I would agree with you. And shout out to your mom. Shout out to Miss Tange. Because Miss Tange always made us uh, <laughs> feel at home over the summer breaks when we was in college, making sure we ate. So, shout out to Miss Tange, man. <laughs> God love her. Uh, I feel like that they are, you know, I think they're intertwined. But I feel like our culture, we have not really taught the aspect of entrepreneurship and only thing, ownership. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel like as black professionals, like especially us millennials, we're yeah. not the type of people who like we're not gonna stay at a job if we're not happy. Yeah, we are not staying at a job if we're not happy. We are not them type of people who are gonna be like, oh yeah, this got good benefits, this got a good salary, um, mm, you got big good benefits, uh, you got a good salary. Are we gonna be able to, uh, you know, retire off of this? We're not those mm-hmm. type of people. Yeah. Like we're we're kind of past that. Yeah. We like if we're not here, we don't care what's happening. Like if I'm not happy, I'm out of here. Right. I will figure it out on my own. Do you think that's just um, us having one an instant gratification or an impulse, or do you think that us just saying like we know our value in ourselves and we kind of understand a little different from the generations before us that? We don't have to be stuck anywhere we don't want to be. We can kind of make our own avenues and ways to, you know, get to where we want to go. Uh, I, it could be instant gratification, but I think it is of from us viewing our parents, our grandparents, working jobs that they didn't necessarily like, mm-hmm. and they just stay for the fact of, well, I got medical, I got this, and it's paying for this house, and it's paying for that. And I just, when I was in college, I realized that, The most dangerous people are people who pretty much uh, have, I don't want to, pretty much have nothing. And they just want to take a risk. So I feel like when you go out and you just simply take a risk on everything, that's when stuff really just starts to happen. Instead of putting yourself in a box and just sticking strictly to that because that's what we were taught. Yeah. But I think that once you just go out, take a risk. So, no, I don't think it's instant gratification. I think it's we saw what it was and we don't want to repeat the same things. Okay. All right. So um, right here, I got somebody on live. They said spending money on school versus entrepreneurship. Mm. Ooh. <laughs> That's deep um, right there. It is. It is. Uh, yeah. Wow. It, yeah. That one got me. That one, so I'm going I'm to see if I can kind of start that all uh, the conversation. So spending. So my undergrad degree, thank God I was blessed to have, like, you know, scholarships for sports and academics and then you know i just paid the rest you know put myself through through college for the rest of that but with that being said yeah like my four years at a private because i was a private institution i didn't go to you know a public school was about thirty two thousand dollars a year yeah so i was there for it you don't finish in four it's 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 hard to finish college in four uh it's really about what you want, honestly, I think. Because I okay. feel like it was worth it for me to go, even though, you know, you have that student loan debt and they call, but everything's suspended right now because of COVID. <laughs> <But> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I just think it was worth it. I think both is worth it, honestly. I think for us, the one thing that we should probably, as a community, as a culture, we should focus on entrepreneurship but we should figure out what we are naturally gifted at Mm. and then go to school for that. So then when you turn around and become an entrepreneur, 
it's kind of easier. So then let's say somebody's a farmer. Okay. They go to school for, I don't know the correct uh, term for it, but they go to school to agriculture. learn that agriculture. Okay. Right? Yeah. And then they start their own landscaping, landscaping business. So let's say they have $32,000 in debt. But with the landscaping business, you come straight out instead of looking for a job and looking for the benefits. You come out, you start making this money, so then you can start kind of paying it, really paying it back. Because student loans, they want you to pay ridiculous amounts yeah. six months after. So if you take, if you have a business that you run or you go into your family business that's already been ran, you can begin to really start paying it off and really make a dent and really affect change. Okay. Uh, so... I think, oh, this is so tough. My thing is that our system is so backward. So you spend, like we said, like $32,000, $32,000 times five. You do the math. I'm not good at math. So. 32,000 times. Yeah. Yeah, that's a lot. Mm-hmm. So it's a lot of money. Um, 32,000 times uh, five. And then on top of that, you know, you go get a job to pay that back. And you're never, it seems like you never equate enough money to pay back your student loans regardless. Right. And that kind of leads into our next conversation. I'm going to talk about this really quick before we go into that. Sometimes we have to go to school be to become that entrepreneur. Doctors can't start a practice without a medical degree. That's a good point. Yeah. That's yeah. a good point because then it's a cycle then. Yeah. Because everything needs a licensure. Everything needs uh, yeah. some type of background or training, even though. Doctors, I'm not throwing shade on them, but doctors, they call it a practice because they always practice it. Yes. <laughs> like, they don't really know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, but like I was saying earlier, I think that goes right along. Like, a doctor, yeah, you do need to go figure it out, but you also have your long-term goal in mind that I want to become an entrepreneur. So I'm trying to hone in and craft my skill so I, I do need the experience so then I can become the entrepreneur and then, you know, Again, I think I think a lot of things that we talk about, we make it separate, but I think a lot of things are together. Yeah. I think we could put a lot of things together, and then it will really just help in the long term. Yeah, so intersectional. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so that kind of goes to what we were talking about in the basis of us as a black culture uh -huh. kicking kids out of 18. <laughs> right. So... What's your thoughts on that? Because me and you got two different experiences. I didn't get kicked out at 18, but it just wasn't any capacity in my house for mm -hmm. me to live there um, when I came home from college. And, and realistically, it would have been nice to be able to stay home for a couple of years, stack yeah. up some money, you know, really build myself some wealth and some cushion mm -hmm. before I went out to the real world. And you got the experience um, opposite. You know, you were able to stay home, yeah. stack your money up. You know, you still had your financial things you had to, you know, pay for as well. But you had a little less of the burden mm -hmm. with that. So what's your thoughts on us as a culture? Because no other culture does that. But no other culture does. Like, they would live in a house with 30 people in a two-bedroom. Like, and yeah. I'm just, like, I'm not exaggerating. I'm just trying to put people in perspective that... People in different cultures, they will live together until somebody makes it mm -hmm. and let them not have to struggle and have that experience of struggle to get them to be successful. Yeah. Uh, I, I think because my mom was kind of kind of like us, even though she's not a millennial, she kind of saw a lot of stuff that my grandparents did, my uh, great-grandmother and my grandmother, and she didn't necessarily like it. So she wanted me and my brother my uh, second brother to uh, stay home, go to school, and then figure it out from there. So we went to school, got our degrees, and of course, we obviously knew how um, how expensive it was. Yeah, because school is already expensive, and then room and board is a completely a different price. But I think the reason that we do that as a culture. Because, again, I think it's something, honestly, I think we were doing it first, but mm -hmm. we didn't capitalize on the opportunity that it was. So just looking at like uh, some older stuff and hearing older uh, family stories and stuff, a lot of people were in one house. Right. And they lived in one house and they passed that house down. Yeah. But the one thing that they didn't do was that didn't uh, essentially work together to put that money back in the house to then mm. help everybody else out so then you could branch out. Literally had a conversation with my mom a few months ago, and she was like, honestly – I was thinking about this, and she was asking me and my brother, why don't y'all just move back home? And the reasoning is because if we combine all of our incomes and put it back into one house, 
the financial freedom and the everything else mm. that we could do would really just be amazing. And at this point, I would I would say probably say it's pride now not to go back. Okay. Because I and that's a completely different story. <laughs> okay. Of not wanting to go back, but I, and it's honestly true. And I remember telling my family about it a few years ago. And we always, me and my family, we always joked about, oh, we should get like a, a big house like they had in the show Greenleaf. Oh, yeah. Which had just one big house and everybody had their own section. Yeah. And that's great, but I, then I think people's personalities come in and one person's too much like the other and you don't like seeing your side all like that. So, so not, I don't, you go ahead and go. Okay. But what, um, what you think? I think it's crazy that our culture does that. Um, yeah. Just in a simple fact um, that how can you build wealth at 18 if you like, hey, you turn 18 or you got a job, now it's time to get your own spot. And it's kind of like we struggle with that, that generationally. It's like you get a job and you making, you think you're making good money. Yeah. But everybody think they making good money until them bills come into play. Right. So when I came home, I, I'm like, yeah, I got $40,000 $40, a year. Right. I'm like, yeah, until you think about, like, the taxes and taxes. paying rent. Uh, you know, to live in a decent area in Cleveland right now, you got to pay at least over $800. Right. Like, $800 of rent. Then you got your car note, your car insurance, groceries. And that struggle um, just knocks our knocks us out. Because yeah. our, our opposites, our other counterparts, and, you know, just other cultures, they don't do that. Like we would say before, that they can stay home to their 30 and literally, like, build and save, pay off half their, you know, student loan debts or anything mm-hmm. and that. For me, I had to get it how I live. Like, when I came home, you yeah. know, like, I came home, I had to, like, stay with um, my boyfriend's sister for a little bit. And, you know, so I got our own spot, got my own spot and whatnot. So, had that... Happening, I was like, man, this is a lot. This is a lot to just be like an adult right away. And just thinking that someone at 18 or 19 to just be like, hey, I took care of you your whole life now. Mm -hmm. And now you're 18. You go out to the world and figure it out. Like That concept is just, it doesn't sit well with me. It it, it doesn't, but I also think we don't. I think we just keep repeating the same cycle because it was done to them, so. You got to get it how you live because I had to get it how I live. And I yeah. had to get it how I live to raise you, not to mention your other siblings. Mm-hmm. And I don't think we really look at the financial aspect of it. I think we just, well, if you got to work two or three jobs. Then do it. Then just do it because I had to do it so you will make it. But I don't think that's the correct way to live or mm-hmm. the correct way to do it. I think absolutely if we were to stay together, put the money together, we could cook uh, – commit and do a whole bunch of changes in our community. For real. We would have, uh, in the neighborhoods we live on and live in, we could have a full street of homeowners. Yeah. Then we uh, move out and create another uh, street of homeowners. Like how it was for um, for my grandparents back in the day. They, obviously, where they used to live, it was just all homeowners, and they were a community, and they stayed together. And the house that... Uh, we had it for a little bit. We lived there for a little bit. My great grandmother owned it. So then my grandmother and the kids stayed there. Then we moved there. And then we just kind of went our separate ways from there. But I think we should, as a whole, probably reconsider and rethink that. Yeah. I um I kind of talked to, we, we talk about this as well with our friend group and some other people I spoke with about tying these two things together. So generational will with us moving out and then on top of that versus the aspect of being privileged versus working hard so our parents didn't want us to struggle right right they didn't want us to struggle like there so then it's other people who like parents who were really well off and made yourself and they kind of can't be self-sufficient right now right so how do you feel like what's the what's the Especially in the black culture, because I feel like in the black culture we don't really have an in between. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm not it's not really a middle class. It's either we got people who hustle and people who it was given to. Right. I. <laughs> I mean, I just. So what's think the balance? I, I, for some, for us to see, for like the privilege to see the people that had to really work to get it, and at the same time, I don't. If you ask your parents, I don't think they would say, "Oh, we're privileged." They would say, 
well, I kind of worked and I tried to hustle to get it. So then they didn't have to struggle like I had to. Mm -hmm. And then if you ask the parents over here, it's like, I didn't really know, but I would rather have my kids be like this. Yeah. So I think the balance would be if everybody could see the true struggle in between. So like if they could have the ability to work like them and then you have this privilege and then us who's doing it, if everybody could just share, share point of views and everybody see how it goes, I think that would be the balance in between. Okay. Yeah, because um, I'm going to say I find myself resentful, but I kind of feel like um, I joke with my little brother. He's 18 um, about this calling all the time because he always said I have fun dad. Cause my dad was younger when he had like the uh -huh. four of us. Like he could move. He was playing basketball and stuff like that. And my dad, um, Colin says, well, I tell him he has financially stable dad. Right. Even though I didn't know he was poor until right. like I got the brush. That's when I know like that culture shift. I always joke and say, you know, I hated brush, but I didn't. I'm not gonna say I hated brush. I I was in culture shock. Right. When I got to that school, coming from where I came from. So it was a giant change for me. And, like, for my brother, he doesn't understand kind of, like, the things that me and my right. other siblings went to. Because, like I said, he has financially stable dad, and yeah. I had fun dad. Yeah. So so even for me, when I moved to uh, South Euclid and started going to Brush, it was a culture shock for me. So yeah. then at that point in high school, my mom was married, and, you know, so more money was coming in the household. But we didn't always... Grew up like that. Right. So, like, my youngest brother, he is in a culture shock right now because he's used to, oh, if I want AirPods, I'm going to get AirPods. Like, I remember me and my uh, second brother, Matt, we asked for a PlayStation uh -huh. when we were younger. And uh -huh. my mom just really couldn't afford it. Yeah. But now, Mason... Mason gets a seven hundred dollar bike because because <laughs> he wanted it because they can afford it now. Yeah. So I I just think that it's a uh, it's a balance, and for us we're trying to make sure that he sees the balance. Like, hey, all of this is good. We grew up here, but the one thing that we do is we work. Like, period. You got to go to work. You got to yeah. do what you can, and you got to hustle. You can't just sit around and be lazy. The uh, excess stuff that's great, but you got to work hard to get it too. Yeah. All right, guys. So we only got four minutes left um, on our podcast. So we're going to kind of go through the live and see, you know, any comments or anything that we didn't get to hit on so far in this first podcast. We talk about Khalid has said we are programmed to get ours and keep it for ourselves for a short term. But don't look at the long term, which is our next generation. I agree with you, but I also have two parts to that conversation we talk about generational wealth and um bringing those two things together yeah my first part is that we send money up instead of down and i kind of heard that off of another podcast when we were talking uh, yeah. um i'm an athlete yeah so yeah, we yeah. both watched that podcast and that was that's the truth yeah like we give money to our parents when we, a lot of us make it because they haven't had it, when in actuality it's supposed to get funneled down right. from us to our kids to our kids' kids. Yeah. I mean, I, I think I think even if you want to take it outside just the uh, household, I think we get it, and then what do we do? We spend it on the $10,000 name brand stuff. Yeah. So I think if we I'd absolutely funnel it down and then learn that we're all a community, and the better off we are, the better off everybody else around us can be. Yeah, exactly. That's... That's the 100. Uh, okay, so hit that. We're going to go to here. Unfortunately, the black community wants to prove they got it. So we gonna, that's going to be a whole other episode right. with the proving. Cause, okay, so me and Marquise, like I said, we got a group of friends. And we always joke, but like, ooh, who the richest in here? And we kind of talk about the materialistic things. Um, just some stuff that we have because we like – me and Marquise, we sneakerheads, so we love tennis shoes and <laughs> things of that assortment. So what do you think about the bragging? Is it a pride thing, or do you think that it's just something that we feel like we need to show that we belong somewhere? I think it's we need to feel like we belong. I feel like for the longest we were without, so now we want to say and show everybody we definitely got it because for the longest we didn't have it. Dang. That's, yeah. Yeah. As long as we didn't have it at all. Yeah. Um. 
So, like I said, we got two minutes left. Uh, this is our podcast, and our it's called In My Opinion. So, just me and Marquise giving our opinion on different things in the black community and what's going on. Uh, we want y'all guys to stay tuning in. We'll be back in two weeks to record the second episode. So, if you want to, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel. It is in my link on um, my bio on Facebook. Um, Subscribe, follow us. Um, if you want us to hear or talk any suggestions about anything else, just DM me or you can DM Champagne Poppy. Um, follow me at Just Call Me CJ. If you don't, it's a shout out. <laughs> <laughs>